for all we know, room B. Um, and up first is uh, Melanie Ramdarshan. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Melanie. I am going to speak about Emma Watson's Feminist Book Club today. I'm probably going to speak very quickly because I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to fit everything into 12 minutes, so bear with me. Um, so, book clubs have been around for centuries, but they've been transformed in recent years by pop, um, in the la especially in the last couple of decades, by popular media phenomena such as Oprah's Book Club. So social technologies have extended the popularity of book clubs in the digital, digital age, encouraging engagement um, through reading on a global scale. A recent example of uh, this book club evolution is the spate of celebrity book clubs popping up on social media platforms. Um, and the main focus of this paper will be a case study of Emma Watson's feminist book club, our shared shelf, or OSS as I'll be calling it throughout. So the growing popularity of OSS, and I've, I've provided some stats here, um, is just really another illustration of how technology can help with community building, critical dis discussion, um, challenging established social and cultural norms, and the development of social movements. OSS members are connected by their shared interest in reading books that challenge the patriarchy. And while the focus is feminism, the, its, members, uh, its membership is not limited to uh, women. According to Watson, everyone is welcome. This reflects Watson's He For She campaign, which invites men to participate in conversations about gender inequality. So through her work on gender inequality, and also as well as a, um, as a well-known fem uh, cele feminist celebrity, Watson has accumulated enough, enough cultural capital to be viewed as a legitimate cultural tastemaker in selecting books for a feminist audience. The feminist celebrity movement is often seen in a really negative light, branded as a diluted, commercialised, um, neoliberalist type of feminism. However, feminist celebrities do actually make feminism a lot more visible um, and thus assist in publicising and popularising issues on gender equality. Feminist celebrities are often characterised by their white, class, cisgender, sexual orientation, able-bodied privilege, and this has garnered, this has garnered um, criticism from many people, um, including intersectional feminists. Watson, in particular, has been heralded as the fresh face of feminism. Um, this type of white celebrity feminism is particularly, particularly media friendly um, and as such influences popular culture and cultural output. However, normative whiteness has been central to feminist celebrities and this type of feminism can extend this narrative. It's also, um, it's also incredibly individualistic and can exclude marginalised groups and is it the... And, is thus at odds with the ostensible um, non-hierarchical ethos of intersectional feminism. So book clubs can be political in their nature. Um, Long, and I've provided the quote here, argues that reading can never be divorced from questions of power, privilege, exclusion, and social distinction. Of particular relevant to this research are the power structures and hierarchies associated with book clubs, um, which can inform the group and or generate informal processes of social control. So OSS is a forum where an established authority figure, Watson, um, is already in place, leading the book club. So power relationships can emerge through Watson's brand of feminism and the selection of books in relation to the OSS demographic. Watson is considered to be what Rayberg uh, Sedo describes as a trusted other, which is a term normally ascribed to friends and family, but can also be um, assigned to cultural, um, cultural tastemakers whose recommendations have, been, have proven satisfactory to the readers. So today, oh, that's a terrible colour, apologies. <laughs> so um, it, it doesn't look like that on my screen. Um, so today we're going to look specifically at um, demographic information um, analysis of a, a random sample of OSS members, uh, the first 15 books on the OSS reading list, and a discourse analysis of why users joined uh, the group. So 
while book clubs were traditionally populated by white, middle-class, cisgender women, they are now comprised of a more diverse group of individuals. Online book clubs have supported this increase in inclusivity. Readers can participate in online forums, regardless of factors such as cultural or socioeconomic background, gender, reading level, or geography, and can choose to participate anonymously. However, as you can see from the stats, Goodreads and OSS in general, are um, they're completely dominated by, um, by female users, especially OSS. So the sample was incredibly international with, for, uh, with users from 91 different countries. Um, most of the users were from North America and Europe. Um, and the majority of the, majority of the sample were for con from countries that were um, majority English and native English speaking. However, this actually varied with the age brackets. Um, the 18 to 25 range, the millennials, the avocado eating millennials, is the most diverse in terms of number of different countries. Um, but it's also the only bracket where the majority of readers are from countries where English is not the native language. Diversity of language and location was less represented in the upper age brackets. Additionally, while the female readers were from a more diverse range of countries, the male readers were actually more likely to be from um, countries where English was not the native language. So, celebrity affiliations can act as a catalyst for people joining book clubs. Um, and there is a correlation between the date Watson created OSS and the number of people joining, the good, uh, joining Goodreads. 415 joined in the month and year that Watson launched OSS. This group of people were, um, were younger, included more men and users from, users from countries where English was not the native language than the overall sample. Um, the male readers in this grouping were particularly diverse from 34 different countries. And although we cannot determine whether Watson's affiliation to Goodreads encouraged all of these users to sign up, we can surmise that this period saw younger readers with less of a native English language and female dominance than the overall sample join Goodreads. So, 15 books uh, written by 16 authors were chosen for OSS as their reading choices um, in this time period. Watson contends that she is, and this is a quote, trying to choose works that cover as much ground as possible and are diverse. Although half the authors in the list were um, white, middle class, cis, um, able-bodied, um, there is an attempt to include more intersectional range of authors that challenge the normative white and middle class feminist narrative. Four openly identify as part of the LGBTQIA community, uh, seven were authors of colour and five are from working class backgrounds. However, the book list has a strong Anglo-American focus and you probably, the writing's so tiny you probably can't really see it. Um, but they're dominated by titles that were originally published in the English language. Several of the books were written by blockbuster feminists, such as Gloria Steinem and Naomi Wolf. Um, these are often American feminist works that conform to traditional rhetorical structures and modes of access. So the list leans towards non-fiction titles, but covers a variety of genres. Memoirs are the most popular. But the list also looks at feminism from a variety of lenses. All of the books in the list were published over the last 40 years, so traverse the second, third, and fourth uh, wave feminism time periods. Um, the North American focus is unsurprising, given that Americans were the most represented nationality in the sample. However, this can be problematic for non-native non English speakers. The OSS sample is an international one, so having such a Western English language focus does not reflect the diversity of perspectives in the group. Um, and this is just an aside. Um, incidentally, the best rated books on the list are by authors of colour. So to help understand the motivations for joining OSS and to gain a better understanding of the OSS membership, an analysis of the introduction thread was undertaken. Um, the main themes that emerged were learning and identity, fandom and connection. 
So the most popular re uh, reason users gave as to why they joined OSS was obviously because they wanted to learn more about feminism. Um, engaging in social media can be a performative act. Users can construct an identity while engaging with social issues. Reading can also be a source of identity formation. So members of OSS are explicitly or implicitly, by being a part of the group, identifying themselves as someone who is interested in reading feminist books. While users expressed um, an interest in gender equality, the majority did not explicitly identify as feminists. Therefore, users were keen to develop their understanding of feminism through their engagement with the books, authors and the OSS community. Even long-standing feminists express a desire to understand the current conversations. As the demographics of the overall sample show, um, OSS is an intergenerational group. Um, and in the introduction, 14 self-declared feminists, and actually it was, uh, it was um, the older generation that were quicker to identify as feminists. Um, so these 14 self-declared feminists who were over 50 years of age, vocalise their interest in connecting with, learning from and supporting um, younger feminists. So the second most popular reason to join, um, yeah, I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. I, I, I give no apologies for that. Um, the second most popular reason to join was the influence of celebrity, which we saw from the number of users joining Goodreads in January 2016. Harry Potter was mentioned often. And as we can see, um, early Harry Potter readers, um, so therefore people who read Harry Potter um, as middle grade readers, um, would actually fit really neatly into the demographic of the um, OSS, like the average age, and they're the same age as Emma Watson as well. So there can be an indirect association between celebrity involvement um, in political, social issues and civic engagement by young people. Young people often try to emulate the behaviour of their celebrity idols. Therefore, Watson's popularity could potentially have positive influence in encouraging young people to join the feminist movement. The third main reason people joined was to be part of a like-minded community, particularly if they felt isolated in the community where they lived or felt their opinions had been attacked in the past. However, users from country where English is not the dominant language highlighted some of the issues of being part of such an Anglo-American-centric community, as we can see here. Additionally, most of the introdu introductions were written in English, irrespective of the reader's mother tongue, which led to 39 members either apologising for or expressing the difficulties in communicating in English. So, just to sum up, the OSS community has grown to be the largest group on Goodreads since its inception in 2016. The group is, has an international, intergenerational membership, but is particularly influential in attracting a younger generation of readers. Although this introduces feminism to a wider audience, there is a risk that cultural hegemony can be endorsed and extended. While Goodreads can seem like, a, a, particularly the OSS group, can, may seem like a global village, power relationships are still very much in existence through the dominance of the English language and Anglo-American culture. Although there are clear thoughts about how to diversify the book choices, there does seem to be a, diff a preference towards English language books written by cisgendered, middle-class, able-bodied white women. Therefore, the reading list does not represent the international and intersectional nature of the group, something several m members voice concerned about. Um, so just to, just to conclude, the publication and promotion of these celebrity blockbusters ensure that some feminisms come to receive cultural legitimacy over others. Watson Celebrity Book Club and the book choices she makes augments these cultural hierarchies. Therefore, OSS replicates and upholds patterns of dominance and exclusions and is not an egalitarian space. This prevents OSS's strand of feminism from being truly intersectional. Thanks. All right, what's up everybody? I'm Zach, I teach at Michigan State University. That will be pertinent later, um, so let's do this. Part one, academic accountability and neoliberal austerity. There is a crisis of financing in public higher education with decreasing state appropriations and the approach of the tuition limit, the key becomes optimization. Work smarter, not harder. 
Faculty must be accountable to those who help them do their work by demonstrating results. And in neoliberalism, results are dictated by the market. Meanwhile, academic analytics, which provides university systems with objective data that administrators can use for strategic decision making, seems to be producing lots of results. In addition to its $10 million annual revenue, its faculty scholarly productivity database has been adopted as a membership indicator by the American Association of Universities, which designates Research One schools here in the US. Every year, I give my university an accounting of my productivity. I tally how many papers I've written, presentations I've given, exhibitions I've done, and so on. It feels oddly like giving the accounting of my sins on Yom Kippur. It's like I'm begging the institution to let me have another year to prove I can do even more than I did this year, that their investment in me, their human capital, will provide growing returns. My belief that I am human capital is but one illustration of the way in which reality is structured by capitalist realism, meaning that we accept there being no realistic alternative to capitalism. Within this framework, the only way to make universities better is to optimize their human and physical capital and maximize return on investment. These returns include rankings, citations, publications, grant dollars, and so on. In the capitalist realist academy, an auditing culture pervades the very bodies of academic laborers. In his prescient 1999 essay, Endowing Mediocrity, Neoliberalism, Information Technology, and the Decline of Radical Pedagogy, Mike Sosterich traces the relationships between cybernetics and capitalist realism that makes advanced analytics an attractive prospect in the age of neoliberal austerity. This relationship is not a coincidence. The modern citation index itself was invented by Eugene Garfield during the Cold War, a mere decade after Norbert Wiener coined the term cybernetics. Garfield was influenced by Vannevar Bush and the early technologies that emerged from the very military academic industrial complex in which Wiener was working for Bush. Back in 1873, the first compilations of data on highly regarded scholars were produced by Alphonse de Candolle and James McKean Cattell. Then in 1934, Paul Otlet described the librarian of the future who would determine the place, the time, and insofar as readers were concerned, the probability for texts to be read, that's a direct quote, hence for exerting their action on society. Eventually in 1955, Garfield proposes his science citation index and in good capitalist fashion, he starts a company, the Institute for Scientific Information, which began publishing the index in 1964. Interestingly, the original mission of the SCI was not citation counting, but improving literature searches. In the mid-1970s, Garfield introduced the journal impact factor as a way to help select sources for the Science Citation Index, but it turned into a widely misused shortcut for attaching a crude score to journals and authors. ISI was eventually purchased by Thomson Reuters, and in 1992, the SCI and sister indexes were merged into the Web of Science hosted on the Web of Knowledge platform, which then became property of Clarivate Analytics. Okay. A number of other indexes followed, and bibliometrics went from being used in the sociology of science to a tool for administrative control, from helping scientists search for literature to determining the value of a scholar. Soon, the web as a metaphor for scholarship led to social indicator mining and altmetrics, in which social media and networked interactions present a more granular picture of impact. A few other observations are pertinent here. One, scholarly metrics, since their inception, have been widely understood by experts as inadequate for assessing faculty performance. Two, there is a consensus that there is no one-size-fits-all metric. Three, bibliometric, critiques of bibliometrics seem to emerge from the belief that there might be a better metric out there somewhere if only we had the right data. A quest for more granular metrics indicates a shared commitment to the idea that the inadequacy of current metrics does not mean that the project of metrification itself is faulty, but only suggests the need for more metrics. This consensus that the Pandora's box of scholarly metrics has been opened is a concession to capitalist realism. Okay, part two, computationalism in the capitalist realist society and beyond. Computationalism, according to David Columbia, is the idea that a great deal, perhaps all, of human and social experience can be explained via computational processes. It completes the argument that the inadequacy of current bibliometric systems should beget more bibliometrics. These metrics support and encourage faculty to pursue biographical solutions to systemic problems, a neoliberal conception of the scholar self. 
In general, we might suggest here that metrics are bad in that they, on the whole, serve to support the very systems that perpetuate inequality while promoting a meritocratic anti-politics. But I would like for us to engage in a brief thought experiment. What if advanced analytics, cybernetic systems of prediction and control were used in the service of a more just society? What if, in, what if in embracing computationalism, we could have luxury communism? Would you still have such a beef with analytics, Zach? I ask because this is the kind of society that Yevgeny Zamyatin envisions in his 1921 sci-fi novel, We. We is about a communist society in which individuals have very little freedom and in which everyone works in the service of the one state. It might be read as an attempt at articulating the problems with a Leninism that assumed the Fortis factory to be the production model par excellence or Taylorism as a way towards improved standards of living for all. After reading We, I thought about how my concerns with metrics are maybe not my, concern, my same concerns as mine with neoliberalism. Companies at the forefront of analytics, Fitbit, Alphabet, IBM, all say they make life better through optimization. Well, what if these companies were nationalized? I mean, cybernetics wasn't unique to the, the United States. The Soviet Union had Gosplan and Chile had Cybersyn. So do we need to optimize for a better society? Willem Flusser suggests that in a world of floating signifiers and total relativism, it's impossible to even believe that the doubt you feel about anything comes from something that legitimately itself cannot be doubted. Flusser argues that the resulting nihilism de-authenticates the intellect, producing an ontological instability that must be soothed. This soothing comes through the seeking of, re of an objective reality in numbers which seem reliable and stable. Demonstrating the intellect as computational can achieve this soothing, and Columbia suggests this is precisely the consequence of Chomsky and linguistics. For Chomsky, language identified with syntax can be applied both to logical formalisms like those used by computers and also to so-called natural languages. All human language, then, is computational at its core. Soothing our ontological instability through computational theories of language or mind produces what Flusser calls an inversion of the vector of signification. Instead of numbers representing certain aspects of people, people themselves come to represent numbers. In such a society, to know is above all to enumerate. We become computational instruments of one another, and the possibility for the social production of inhumanity increases. The realization of the cybernetic of ideal of optimization is not then and can never be the kind of utopia that neoliberals or left accelerationists would have us imagine. It is instead the inhuman, programmed world of we. Okay, part three. The value of the suboptimal. If the dangers of computationalism have nothing to do with whether or not we live in capitalism, then the question of alternatives becomes tricky. I believe that an alternative project hinges on the value of the suboptimal, the inefficient, the unnecessary, friction, slowness, and delay, which create fissures in the hegemony of optimization. I also wonder if, ironically, the last hope for the suboptimal is in the academy, when the exploration of the unknown must be optimized. <laughs> wow, that's good. I didn't expect that. Uh, when the exploration of the unknown must be optimized, we are left with an atrophied and anemic version of knowledge itself. We must resist this tendency at all costs. Before I go on, I'd like to introduce an important concept to my work. Hyperstition is basically about when fiction makes its way into reality taking the temporal form of will have been. So, to create a suboptimal future requires, one, producing fissures in computationalist hegemony today, and two, producing hyperstitional visions that not only combat capitalist realism, but that do so without romanticizing computationalism. In order to produce a small fissure in computationalist hegemony in the academy, this slide is super blown out and I apologize. I recently made a piece of software called Citation Bomb into which you enter a paper you've cited and it finds the top 10 related papers on Google Scholar, throws them into a four point text Word doc, which is white, and then asks you to copy and paste this into the references section of the paper you're writing. When your paper is published, Google will index all aspects of this paper, finding all the citations, including the hundreds in white. The idea is to flood the citation market and devalue it as a commodity. Here, I'm aiming to create a crisis of academic accountability, but this project is more symbolic than tactical. Who knows if it would even do what I think it would do, and even if it does, it would require thousands of people to use it. 
This project echoes elements of the work of others who have been much more successful than me in a variety of arenas, folks like the Critical Art Ensemble, the Electronic Disturbance Theater, and the writings of Legacy Russell on glitch feminism. Now, the idea for the citation bomb originated from a film I made in which all faculty have stock tickers outside their offices that display real-time metrics about their value to society. Like other dystopias, though, I found the kind of hyperstition in which I was attempting to engage somewhat problematic. I am now instead seeking complex heterotopias that function as new orienting narratives, such that their hyperstitional capacity can nudge us towards an anti-dystopianism. The autolith groups autolith films do precisely this, carrying out what has been called a creative sabotage of the future. These documentary fictions put time out of joint in a way that reveals both lost pasts and potential futures. The in the autolith films, the narrator is a far off descendant of Angelika Sagar, co-founder of the autolith group, who's working through her family's archives. Sagar's descendant is a post-human living in space who is attempting to stitch together a history of how humans went from them to us. Footage from the past, paired with a narration from the future, casts a new light on how the present might play out. What other documentary fictions might we create, and what kinds of historical inspiration for them might we unearth? I'd like to conclude by talking about my institution, not its administration's recent horrific conduct, but about its radical past. In 1968, MSU provided initial funding for the Detroit Geographic in Expedition and Institute. Described as an experimental community college, the institute provided free courses to Detroit residents in cartography, geography, community activism, and urban planning. By 1970, the institute enrolled 500 students in 11 courses, at which point its funding was terminated. The countermaps produced by this coalition of academics and inner city residents were urgent, angry indictments of a form of capitalism they called interior colonialism. What an incredible use of institutional resources for extra institutional imperatives that clearly did not align with the institution's strategy of optimization. I have no idea how to connect these dots just yet, but the lost past of the DGEI and what my school or world might look like if it had continued combined with documentary fiction like that of the Autolith Group, as well as with tactical interventions like my citation bomb, might somehow point towards new directions for knowledge production that celebrate the suboptimal in all parts of life, including the academy. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is Guerra Kiwana. Uh, I'm a Ugandan, uh, and this is <laughs> Koli. Uh, we co-founded uh, Afro-Urban, and today we're going to talk about urban theory and practice uh, by and for Africa. Um, so I was born in Zimbabwe, and I grew up in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, for the first 10 years of my life. And um, then I moved to Zimbabwe for high school, slash Zambia, and then Australia. So. Uh, I've been in the States, well, North America for five years now, so I'm technically what you would call an Afro-Australian. Um, so the reason we're giving you this background is so you understand where we come to in the context of Afro-urban as, as a concept. Yeah, yeah, and I, am, well, I also identify as what the kids call a third culture kid. Uh, so I grew up uh, in East Africa, um, between Uganda and Kenya, and I'm currently working in, tr uh, in London, UK, as well as Toronto, Canada. Um, with uh, it within the like uh, fintech space, um, so I my interests are to leverage technology to democratize financial services uh, and promote promote financial inclusion, um, as well as uh, find an uh, an enclave of that within urbanism and urban studies. Um, I hope to the confluence of my expertise and passions marry design think uh, design thinking. Fintech, urban studies, uh, and urban studies to decolonize, democratize, and reimagine urban spaces, uh, financial inclusion, and intersexual feminism. Uh, so, ironically, Guerra and I met at uh, an, a people of color book club. Yeah, we met in a book club, actually. Yeah, that was <laughs> <laughs> in Toronto. That was uh, for, for people of color. Um, so, we're going to start with defining Afro urbanism. Um, so, this definition is something that. Uh, Koli and I came up with, Koli, I think Koli did a lot to come up with this one. Um, so basically refers to the practice of studying, documenting, and building culture, architecture, and urban spaces on the African continent by and for Africans. Um, 
so uh, sorry, I'll, uh, urbanism. Sorry, African urbanism considers elements uh, unique to the African continent, like uh, the insecure, non-poor phenomenon, uh, public health through conservation, uh, and the ballooning populations uh, within the continent, especially with regards to go moving into the urban spaces. Um, Afro urbanism ex expresses the many characters of the metropole uh, on the continent and how these inform our culture. Um, how these inform culture. Uh, Engage by engaging with diverse experience and uh, that, that Africans on the continent within the urban spaces have. So we have to start uh, sort of not quite at the beginning, but at the beginning of this discussion uh, in terms of urbanism. So uh, at, but, uh, during the 19th and 20th centuries, the uh, European powers basically carved up Africa. Um, the scramble for Africa is what a lot of historians refer to it as. Um, and this was the start of, of this is the start of our conversation, um, and so uh, with regards to urbanism, we must have uh, colonialism in the rear view when we're talking about this. Um, so, how is urban is uh, our cities affected by colonialism? We still feel that today. So, this is a tweet that was just a few days ago, uh, tweeted by a very big public uh, newspaper publication in Uganda. Um, of an intersection that is really busy. This intersection, millions of people go through it every day, so every every, every month, um, and every year, like clockwork, it floods. It floods during, uh, so Uganda has two seasons, the rainy season and the dry season. And when the rainy season happens, there's a lot of torrential rain. Um, this intersection floods every single year, and everyone is surprised by it, but we're kind of used to it now. Um, this is due to the fact that Uganda's drainage system was built to mimic London. Uh, London where it snows, London where there's ice, London where um, people are using sidewalks and streets. So like Kampala is, was built and other uh, colonized cities across Africa were built on the rails of um, Western uh, urban theory and practices. So I'm just gonna stand because I'm gonna be a little bit yeah, honest. I'll stand you. Don't have to stand if you want. I want to. I feel like I don't like holding mics. <laughs> um, so, who were we? And, you know, how did our colonizers see us um, to start off with? So, they came in without any sort of respect for any sort of urbanism that existed before. So, because they saw us as uncivilized, uh, requiring religion, and underdeveloped. I thought we'd have a clicker. So, here is a photograph of. Uh, my great-grandparents in Johannesburg uh, in 1902. And you can see they're wearing Western clothing. Um, the Westernization of African people can be seen even up to this day in the way we try to emulate European standards in, of beauty and dress and speech. Um, there's this sort of self-cringe and a pride in being Westernized or Europeanized. So this comes from the idea that we are underdeveloped. And this came from Western, like a lot of Western countries' justification for controlling us, because they had to have a reason to come over, right? Why are you here? Because we're trying to help you, but at the same time pillage your resources. The premise, if you think about this, this, is, this was the premise of apartheid. Africans cannot be trusted to govern themselves or make decisions for themselves. So here we have an image. I'm an architect, so there, there are a few buildings in this. So, <laughs> Um, here we have an image of the uh, parliament, the South African parliament in Cape Town. This could be anywhere in Europe. Uh, and this has a lot to do with the fact that there was an emphasis of building a European stage on the African continent. So who are we now? How do we see ourselves? Um, after, so African countries became independent after the Second World War, except for Ethiopia. Ethiopia was never really colonized. Uh, and uh, socialist policy was a big part of post-independent ideals, because we needed, we felt, well, I w a lot of people felt that there needed to be a redistribution of resources and for people to become self-empowered. Unfortunately, due to Western meddling and intervention, uh, sort of there was division in these progressive movements. And examples of this are the assassination of Patrice Lumbumba and Thomas Sankara. Um, so I, I just want to highlight one thing. I'm a person of South African descent. And, uh, and I'm also an Australian. Um, recently, our Minister of Home Affairs made a comment about white South Africans and them needing to be given uh, refuge in, South, in, uh, in Australia without understanding the history of why there needs to be redistribution of resources in South Africa. 
The web has provided a platform for pro-white farmer groups, the Sudlanders, which is closely aligned and has learned its tactics from the alt-right to be able to sort of progress this agenda. Um, uh, so we should start off with the uh, with the post in the post colonial nations. There was a big emphasis on nation building at that stage, and you can see that this is uh, the Kenyatta Conference Center in Nairobi. Um, modern because it was after the Second World War, modernism was a big part of what was happening at that stage. But you can see there is definitely like an African accent to this modernism. Um, in a similar way to when you walk through New York streets, the pre-war buildings were built with a heavy European influence, but you can definitely, when a photograph is taken, you know that it's in New York and it's American. Uh, the economic issues uh, from the dividing of all the progressive movements resulted in the stalling of nation building and a brain drain to the West. Um, I guess I'm part of that brain drain. Um, so self-determination in the 21st century is happening at a micro scale through fashion. For example, Gloria Wavamuno, uh, a Ugandan uh, designer. Literature, you guys I'm sure have all heard of Chimamanda Adichie. Uh, platforms like Nollywood. This, this work is telling our stories for us uh, through, the, through the internet. The internet has really enabled this and a large part through the social networks. So just as an example as to just sort of examples as to why this is inevitable. Um, so the mobile use in Africa is set to grow to 1 billion uh, users by 2023. That's a growth rate of 6% each year. And there will be the growth rate of urbanized Africans will go from 36% to 50% by 2030. So it's inevitable that there will be this idea of the post-colonial image. And we picked up this image in particular from the art exhibit that we ran just to show you that there's there's sort of a pride in being African. Um, and of course, I will, remittances are a big part of what's happening in Africa. And diaspora, the conversation between the diaspora and uh, local people is what's sort, of le what's sort of being used to leverage the internet. So I brought this up, the National Museum of uh, African, National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC, because it's designed by David Ajay who is a uh, British architect, but was born in Tanzania to Ghanaian diplomatic parents, and this project is in the US. Uh, importantly, the actual lattice structure is influenced by the design of the Yoruba, uh, by patterns made by the Yoruba. Uh, yeah, so thank you. I'm gonna move on to talking about uh, leapfrogging, leapfrogging technology. So basically, this is what is we're hoping to, well, is actually uh, in place right now, propelling Afro-urbanism right now. So I'm gonna talk about, we talked about remittances, uh, money in Kenya. So mobile money, it's called M-Pesa in Kenya, and it's across various African countries, have played a really key role in uh, helping financial inclusion, as well as um, financial, uh, just helping people actually participate within in the economy, uh, which is also a very capitalist way of looking at the world, but that's for, for another day. Um, so for example, in 2017, also I'll explain what M-Pesa is. M-Pesa is basically Venmo, but this has been going on for 20 years now. Uh, basically money on your phone. So for example, when I lived in Kenya, I did not have a bank account. I used my phone for everything, rent, paying for like a, something at the pub next door, um, sending friends P2P payments. And this is all done with via a phone and you can have any kind of phone. No, you don't need a smartphone to use it. Um, so m -Pes is actually behaving like a bank now. They actually uh, give out loans, they help people save, um, they have various uh, groups that have started leveraging this technology. For, so for example, in Kenya, there's something called Chama groups, uh, which are informal savings and investments groups uh, that are not regulated, but are actually helping people um, participate in the economy in ways that are very, that are reimagining finance. So things like uh, credit are foreign to these, uh, these communities. Um, and lending in these in Kenya, for example, or I'll, I'll give you Uganda as an example. The Ugandan uh, interest rate, I think, for, for, for borrowing at a bank is about, about 23 to 28%, uh, which is insane if you think about it. Um, so the having leapfrog technology within finance that helps helping people in urban centers actually participate and um, engage in the economy is really helpful. Um, so I'm also gonna talk about uh, technology that is used to 
in place of public services in cities as well as in rural areas. Uh, so Rwanda um, is currently using uh, drone technology and drones to deliver medical supplies to remote areas. This is mostly due to the fact that there's no uh, reliable roads or infrastructure, like a transport infrastructure in place. Um, later, we're going to show a video about uh, tran like transport reimagined in Kenya. Um, I'm going to talk also a little bit. We're going to show you a quick little clip about a uh, movie hall. So this is a, a social um, aspect of, of city living. So in Uganda, movie theaters are there's like a one I think in Kampala, uh, and it's very expensive. The average Ugandan cannot afford to go to it. So in Uganda, there's these movie halls that have come into come into being, and they're basically uh, they look exactly like what this looks like right now. It's a bunch of people sitting uh, and a screen, and the screen is playing Die Hard, but uh, you know, or whatever. And and there's someone translating it in real time. Um, so I'm just gonna show a quick video of what that looks like. <laughs> So that was a little short clip from a film by a really amazing Ugandan director named Nikisi Saramaga Jamo. She's really prolific. You should check out her work on Vimeo. Um, so she actually took a dive into these communities to see what how they shared culture uh, and how they're sharing Western culture and like translating it and the meanings shift and change uh, with, within these urban spaces. Um, so, yeah. So how do we connect? Um, Koli, we're going to talk about this? Yeah, we can just run. I'll just, I'll, I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> we'll just uh, run through it quickly because we're, yeah. ju we're just about out of time. So we connected generally through social uh, interactions. Uh, a lot of people just knew each other on Instagram and connected us. And the purpose of this conne initial connection was to form a collective for an art exhibit on the 20th of January. So that happened in New York. And we're sort of moving forward now with the narratives and further art exhibits. And we're just going to run the narratives video quickly, and then that's, that's it. Just a little preface to this. Um, this collective grew out of um, people where we're all like-minded, wanting to tell and share African urbanist stories, uh, a group of, of architects, urban planners, all kinds of great people, artists as well. Uh, and this is kind of propelling. We're hoping to propel this uh, into a movement and it, it will be propelled into a movement um, that is Afro-urbanism. So here's a clip. Welcome to... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't preface this. This is <laughs> Sheriff Maina is a uh, Matatu uh, conductor in Nairobi. Matatus are the mode of public transit. Um, so when you think of the MTA, you get really bummed out, right? Am I correct? Who smiles on the MTA? No one smiles on the MTA. Like, that's the subway in New York. No one... Toronto, the TTC is equally as disgusting and terrible. In Nairobi, uh, the matatus are used, it's, it's like public buses, and they, it's been reimagined in a way that is really social and community focused. Uh, matatu drivers uh, design, there's no like uniform uh, design for the vans. They design the, whatever, they, there's one, I think in a famous TV show called Sensei, the, the guy was driving the Rod Van Dam van, uh, and he like designed it off of uh, Van Dam. Um, so yeah, this this is uh, someone who uh, is an internet friend of ours um, named Chef Mina. So you can watch his Sheriff Mina. This is his taxi. Welcome to <laughs> I'm Sheriff Mina uh, from AKA Sheriff 001. This is flight flight 236 representing Nairobi. So this was, uh, he was actually in the New York Times recently. Um, and that's the next phase of where we're going with this. We're trying to just have these conversations defined by Africans and not sort of like in a national geographic type way. Exactly. So removing the co the colonial white gaze and actually building and, and telling stories that are by us for us. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for the last speakers. 
Um, how do you parlay around the difference between like when you talked about redistribution of wealth, uh, reparations versus now in the neoliberal world they call like public-private development partnerships? It's kind of neocolonialism. Uh, so if I just can reiterate your question, you were asking about how how to uh, work with like so. Sorry, develop. Sorry, can you re-ask so you're again? Navigating between um, getting real needed resources mm -hmm. and uh, making up for uh, past colonial um, and present day colonial uh, relations. Yeah. How do you navigate between that subversive like? neo-colonial uh, institutions of development world versus like reparations or more explicitly anti-colonial funds? Yeah, so that, that ties into um, what we talked about about self-determination. So figuring out ways uh, for people within these communities to actually like build their own solutions um, that are, so for even, even with like the idea of using like design thinking to do that, taking the colonial aspect of it out, because even design thinking is pretty colonial, like thinking of a problem, coming up with a solution and then like, planting that solution in a place, you know? So uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Do you have anything else to say about that? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's really hard and it's, the reality is as Africans, we need people to step back and let us make those mistakes because it's a process that needs to happen. And unfortunately, it hasn't been allowed to happen because there's always meddling and interference. And I understand we live in a global world, but the meddling doesn't come from a place of trying to guide the, the, pro, the, the process in a way that's productive. And that's the issue that, so I don't know what the answer is. I think we just have to keep trying until we get it right. But, sorry. but also f with focus on like actually building solutions and, and uh, practices and theory that is like removes the colonial Western developer development world gaze. Uh, any more questions? speaker Melanie so it's just questioned uh we're gonna have a conversation um <laughs> what in your research uh have you seen the impacts of like uh so for example we talked about how we met in a uh, POC book club have you any research about that or anything to, to add on to that like the importance of it or so um with regards to OS is, is can you hear me yep with regards to OSS, with um, in terms of um, serving marginalized communities, there's a lot of farm labor going on. So there are lots of subgroups within OSS where um, marginalized communities are um, connecting and discussing, et cetera, et cetera. But um, also in the UK, there are lots of like there are lots of people of color um, reading groups, uh, grassroots networks surrounding literary culture, et cetera, and um, I think that's where the change is happening in the UK. I, I'm not sure about the US, but that's certainly where the the change is happening at the moment. So um, yes and no is is the answer to that question. I'm looking at I'm extending this, looking at um, reader response and reader connections. So I'll see if anything like that comes up. But there are it's the same things that happening in the UK. There's lots of um, little groups that are kind of making change really. Uh, this question is for Zachary. Um, I really enjoyed your talk about um, ha like academia being a good place for the subversion of the suboptimal. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the citation bomber you built and why higher education is, is a good site for this kind of subversion? Thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, so I would say that there's two maybe components of my interest in higher education. One is um, to kind of resist this narrative that's about navel gazing because so many people experience higher education in one form or another today. It, I think, operates in part as a sort of compass for the rest of society. And second, the sort of sub, like point B to that is that like the, the neoliberalism that we're experiencing right now emerges directly out of the academy. The academy is not experiencing it. Like it comes from where we are. So, um, so that's the sort of, the um, interest in specifically dealing with the educational institutions. The citation bomb came out of uh, just sort of trying to figure out, okay, like, is there anything I can do? Is there anything I can do to basically 
take what has become a marketized commodity and just torpedo the value of it. Um, and basically the, the problem is I have no idea how Google Scholar's algorithms actually work. There's only been like two studies that have reversed, reverse engineered them. Um, other organizations have slightly more sophisticated uh, citation tracking um, uh, algorithms. So they might be taking things that are specifically visible as opposed to anything that resembles text on the page. Um, so, you know, it, I don't know if it will actually do anything, but it's live. Uh, it's online. You can feel free to download it. It's on the College Art Association's website. And, you know, the more people that use it, who knows, you give it a shot or at least, you know, telling, I think maybe more important is the symbolic component of it is to be able to have a conversation about why we feel the need to track our citations in the first place. What does that tell us about the sort of um, game of academia that we're all trying to play? My, my question is for the last two speakers. Um, can you speak more about the reclaiming of the narratives and how your own personal backgrounds might help fuel that? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, anyone here seen, uh, well, what's it called? Black Panther? Okay, that's everyone. You should all see it. Um, so that's a really good example of, of African narratives that are that are being told in a really interesting way. but are also slightly void of, uh, of African voices. Um, so actually culture, so you talk, we talked about fashion and culture and, and film um, is I think the first frontier that, that is gonna reclaim our own stories in our own voices. So for example, Nollywood in Nigeria is a really great example. Um, and even Bollywood in India, they are able to, to tell their own stories, like they have their own like directors from these places with these experiences and not, it's not being, uh, developed for international consumption as being if, if it is consumed internationally that's cool dollars are nice but um, it's initially it's it the main goal is for it to be consumed locally and from that um, more stories can be told and more imaginings can be had but yeah so we ran out of time but I was gonna talk I was gonna say something about the exhibit so one of the most powerful points in the exhibit for me personally was there was a black American lady who came in and she was looking at the pictures and I've, I've lived in New York now for this is my third year and there's a lot of anim there's not a lot of cohesiveness between the African the Caribbean and the black American communities and she came in and she said oh I've never seen she, she, she lived in social housing just down the street. She's like, I've never seen images of Africa that don't show children with, you know, flies or something negative. And this was the first time. And our images weren't all like non, excuse my language, non shithole places. They were just real images of how people were living life. And that was really powerful to me because this is, this is really dangerous because she's a black person. And if she sees Africa as that, that's where she's from. So what message is she being told about who she is? Does that answer your question? Um, so this is for the, this is for the last two folks who went. Um, and you brought up a, um, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can see me, but you brought up a very interesting uh, point. Um, and that's something that I've been like grappling with, like tension across the diaspora. How do you suggest, and maybe like this is the point, is that like um, folks who are African need to like create this space for themselves by themselves. So like this could be just like a silly question, um, but how do you suggest that um, particularly black Americans um, work with African folks to like, to foster this sense of like community that you speak of, like to foster that like self-determination, if that's like a thing. Yeah, I can, thank you, that's a great question. Um, I think listening is a really important thing. Uh, and while, you know, it is great. Like, I think I'm a huge fan of the diaspora, like various like black individuals or black black folks, um, like seeing some kind of uh, Marcus Garvey-esque uh, like future um, in Africa. Um, but I think it's important that, to first listen and document uh, the the past and, and, and like histories 
uh, and understand where that is coming from. Like, you know, I wear Chitenge, like, which is what I'm wearing right now. This is not like, a, of course, a fashion like decision, but there is history behind this, and there's there's history behind like a lot of the, a lot of these things. So like, it's kind of like understanding where it's coming from, um, and even like since Black Panther came out, I, I saw someone tweet about. Uh, I think it was a Kenyan person tweet about like being angry at the fact that America now it's cool to be uh, African. Um, you know, having grown up, I think she she saw, actually saw on YouTube Evelyn from the internet. She grew up in in the states and she talked about how she was made fun of by Black Americans and ostracized for being African. Um, and now it's cool. And that's that's one way of people who are thinking in that way. And like it's it's you know really unfortunate. But yeah, I think it starts off with listening and understand understanding. So. I think I think um, we have to sort of. I totally agree with that. I think we have to give credence to the fact that we have been working together subconsciously. It's just now because of the way the world is so connected, we're actually interacting with e with each other. The civil rights movement actually was a big part of what uh, thrust forward African countries in their drive towards independence, um, because it happened before a lot of African countries were independent, and so. I think we just have to find ways, like listening and understanding, ways to work together for a common cause. And it's it's just people all around. We all need to listen to each other and give each other space to speak and listen and be heard. Um, this is touched upon, I think, by Fennel and uh, someone else is just skipping my mind. I think it was, I can't remember it. But yeah, basically, uh, so for example, Fennel inspired Malcolm X. You know, Franz Fanon was in Algeria, which is a country in Africa, and his work uh, on like violence and and revolution inspired people like uh, Malcolm X and Thomas Sankara. So there's definitely like ways that that like um, these these cultures can be shared and like uh, bridges can be created. So, yeah. thank you. This is a very quick question, just like the theme of. But clubs keeps coming up, and I'm curious, like, if you, um, any of you, were to design a, a book club, or like had a, a, you know, maybe you have a group of white people who populate mm -hmm. book clubs, but are wishing to interrogate their participation in colonial systems or imperialist systems, what would be titles you would throw? Like, if you're not doing the mass market feminism, but you're like, oh, you're interested, and you actually want to have an honest conversation, does anything come to mind? Um, so what's really interesting, I did this study um, for a book chapter that I wrote, and I, I'm obviously very critical of the OSS in it. Um, I submitted the chapter in December, and then in January, um, Emma Watson came out um, saying, yeah, I've, I've been a, well, I'm paraphrasing, saying, yeah, I've been a white feminist. You know, I, I need to actually look at, um, re-look re at my own practices of feminism, um, et cetera, et cetera. And she, she, um, She's introduced two new books, um, both by people of color, since since uh, that. And I think it's she she introduced uh, Renault Edo Lodge's excellent book, um, "Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race," um, and another book which I um, I can't think of off the top of my head, but it's it's um, um, it's about a, a First Nation. It's by a First Nation um, American author. Uh, uh, it's a memoir as well. So. Um, I think a good starting point is Renault Edo Lodge's uh, book um, because it's it's just a really easy way to to help people understand. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are. Absolutely, uh, I think books that are written for white people yeah. uh, are good, but also books that are not written for white people are good, and like understanding ones space that they take up within those space those like uh intersectional spaces i guess so i think the the issue that we have globally at the moment is that the world is written in a way that sort of and i know it's written in a way that sort of tells the story of a white person so because we are third culture people there's no place that i can go that will tell my story fully so everywhere i go i'm other but i'm also a part of the story so it's kind of, it, it's good for people who grew up in homogenous societies, and this is for Africans as well, to read outside where they grow up so they understand that theirs is not the only way of being. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, I was just going to add as well, um, I completely agree with what you say, and I think um, especially in terms of 
what I was talking about with um, the lack of international representation in the authors. It was very Anglo-American, so reading tr works in translation. Um, there's a lot of you know excellent African authors, especially Nigerian authors, uh, writing at the moment. They're they're being especially published a lot in in the UK at the moment, and Chimamanda Adichie um, uh, and Achebe as well have, have have really been the catalyst for that. So yes, yeah, stories where um, otherness is incidental rather than the the main focus of the story, I think, are incredibly important. That it's just one fact, you know, it's just not the defining factor of the of the narrative. Uh, just a little anecdotal thing uh, about that is so uh, growing up, I read the famous five. Anyone know like Enid Blyton? Yeah, anyone familiar? Okay, I guess only people in colonized countries. <laughs> cool. Um, so Enid Blyton is like a British author who wrote about like the rolling hills and moors of like Dorich or something like that. And like as like a kid in East Africa, I was like, what? Uh, like <laughs> talking about like lime, key lime pie and like cordial and I was like what the hell is this stuff um, but like that for me like reading that I was like this is a whole world that I don't know anything about and uh, like I was lucky well I guess I a lot of people will be like oh like I wasn't you know people now like want their children to be reading things about like like their own cultures which is great but I, I think for me it was really interesting because I got a chance to imagine and understand another world um, so I guess like maybe even children as well, like young people reading stories that are from cultures that are not their own, uh, which I don't think happens in North America or like the Western world. People read Harry Potter, uh, which is great. And I, I'm, I love Harry Potter. Uh, but like, you know, it's it's reading stories with people whose names are different to the names you know and like of names of places that you don't know and you've never heard of um, that. Yeah. So well, there's a massive push at the moment. Um, there's, it, I, and obviously I come from a literary kind of culture background there's a huge push at the moment and um, there's the we uh, the we need diverse books campaign um in the uk there's there are lots of grassroots and um institutional institutional initiatives to um promote um i hate the word diverse so uh, inclusive um to um promote inclusive authors and uh, writing so th th you know it's at a very basic level but it is it is happening on that, do you think that celebrity, like the fact that it's a celebrity-run book club, like kind of militates against that sort of principles of inclusivity in a way? Like they're sort of contradictory logics. It's yeah, there's a dichotomy there. there um, it is, it is a contradiction, isn't it? Because um, on the one hand, I think, you know, like I said, it, there were lots of people, lots of young people, lots of um, male readers from different countries who might not have engaged with feminism had it not been, you know, Hermione um, running the, the book club. Um, and yeah, um, I also looked at, um, I, I didn't talk about it in the presentation, but I also looked at, I did the discourse analysis of how Watson's um, discussions changed throughout the course of the the, the book club as well. And um, she turned from increasingly like part of the group to this sort of really hierarchical figure. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's it's it's really difficult because it it does she does such a great job of attracting people to um, engage in discussions that they might not have done otherwise. But at the same time, the discussions are very much coloured by uh, white feminism. So, um, yeah, it's really I find that really difficult. Thank you all. This was super interesting. Um, my question actually kind of builds on the the things you were just saying because one thread I was kind of noticing throughout was the the complicating um, and the complicating aspect of and challenges of the kind of um, uh, Western capitalist mass media. Um, and I think like in the way that you were talking about it with the book club, but then also kind of for the, the latter three presenters projects and trying to build attention for your projects within a system that kind of validates attention individuals and, you know, kind of like hierarchical ideas. So I was wondering if any and all of you could speak more to that. Wow. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, I, I think that there's definitely a tension there between the need to operate within the system. I guess this is this is part of what um, what I think is important to have a discussion about, and I think it relates maybe to all of our work, is the question that that tension raises, which is, is the way out through? I, I'm not sure. 
um, like is the way to emerge from neoliberalism? Like, are we, are we doomed to be accelerationists in some way, whatever that becomes? Is the tendency towards surplus value zero? And should we just push it as hard as we possibly can? Um, and then that's where the, to me, the question of orienting narratives comes in. So like, do we look to the films of the Autolith group or do we look to Afrofuturism? Do we look to Nalo Hopkinson's novels? Do we read Ursula Le Guin? Like who can tell us what that's gonna look like? Um, I, I think that's a huge question. Um, you know, it's clearly a question you guys are asking. I mean, with us, it's a little bit, yes, it's totally about that. But with us, it's a little bit different because the people we're trying to reach aren't really in the mainstream. Like a lot of these things happen in networks. Um, so I was born in Zimbabwe and uh, recently we had our long-term president removed. <laughs> but so when I was speaking to people who still live in Zimbabwe, they didn't get their news from the, main, from the mainstream news. It was from Facebook and WhatsApp and that's kind of the way the networks operate. And I found even with the exhibit, we really had to rely on people talking to other people. And those are the people who came. Because if there's an interest within the community, that's actually, I think that's a good way to gauge the real interest. If there's an interest within the community, it'll spread further. Um, yeah, jumping off of that, uh, definitely like, while it is tempting to think that to move forward, you have to basically walk through the, well, trudge through like this, neoliberal capitalist cesspool in which we exist um it, it's also important yeah to look at like the smaller communities in which this happens this is a really bad example but i'm going to talk about how you talked about the alt-right and the um i forget the name of the group swidlanders Swid so these these are um white south africans who learned tactics from the alt-right about like propaganda um, and uh, someone earlier yesterday Jasmine Valve had a uh, talked about how the Baltimore police was it Baltimore police learned tactics from the IDF the the in, the Israeli defense forces um, on so they learned from the Israeli defense forces how to like control crowds and communities uh, whereas uh, they the other way around the Americans taught the Israeli defense forces how to surveil their own people. Um, so there's there's definitely exchanges that are happening in like these really small like small spaces that are actually making really big impacts. I, that was a really bad example. I'm so sorry, but like just <laughs> but like if you understand what I'm saying, like there's these things are happening in like really small like very radical groups, uh, and maybe it will become mainstream. And if it does, like hopefully it's better, uh, and we do better. But yeah. Um, I was actually going to say as well, so a lot of the artists that we had in the exhibit, please follow us, afrourban.art, little spiel, um, <laughs> Twitter and Instagram. But um, a lot of the artists that we had on exhibit were people who were just doing what they were doing, like people who were just taking really amazing photographs and posting them to Instagram. They weren't, like no one was looking to be famous. So it's sort of that incidental, for me, it's the incidental documentation the sort of documentation that it's not like me going out and taking photos of buildings. This person just happened to be taking a photograph and there happened to be buildings in the city and in, in the scenery. Sorry, no, I, went complete, I, I went completely away from the question. <laughs> Um, I just have something really quick to say. So um, in terms of how things are developing in the UK, um, in terms of ha making literary culture more inclusive, it is um, marginalised groups that are putting in a lot of labour to do so. Um, however, the problem with things like uh, independent media, etc., is that, for firstly... Um, they don't have a massive reach. And secondly, they still, to some extent, uphold the structures of inequality. You know, they replicate the structures of inequality. So, sadly, I think we do have to work with the mainstream, so mainstream cultures and mass media, etc., as well. Yeah, we're just about out of time. So thank you very much, presenters.